Mule this. Okay. Okay. One, two, three, go. Okay, so next, <laughs> let me talk about first uh, what we mean by vacuum transitions. Next. So we're going to have this general set of presented here. We're going to have a canonically coupled scalar field to general relativity, uh, which has a um, scalar field potential, which have two minima, one minima, one minimum has greater energy, which will be the false minimum, and what global minimum, which will have the lowest energy, so it has it is the true minimum. So quantum mechanically, we can expect transitions by tunneling from the false minimum to the true one, and we're going to describe the transition probabilities for this uh, kind of transition. Next. So these uh, transitions are described by uh, nucleation of true vacuum bubbles in the background of false vacuum. It has been studied by Euclidean methods in the 1980s. They employed a Euclidean path integral with gravity, but one limitation of this approach is that we can only obtain a semi-classical results, so it is not possible to compute quantum correction in the form of loop contribution. So we're going to employ, employ a Lorentzian method, which uh, in, uh, uses uh, the wheeler dewitt equation, which is the quantum mechanical version of the Hamiltonian, classical Hamiltonian constraint. So we have a wave function of the universe, and we want to employ the interpretation of these solutions um, as the ratio of two solutions as transition probabilities between two between two configurations. So they, these transition probabilities will describe creation of universes of a given size by these vacuum uh, transitions. Next. Next. So let me present first the general method. The general method, uh, we do not uh, take a particular uh, metric. So we employ a general Hamiltonian constraint with um, one uh, square terms and the momenta linear terms of the momenta and a general function f, which will have the scalar field potential. We obtain the Wheeler with equation by quantum by uh, doing canonical quantization. Then we're going to propose a WKB type ansatz of the wave function of the universe. This S function will have a semi-classical expansion. The first term will be the classical action, and we will then the semi-classical result with this. The first, the second term will be this one will be the first quantum correction, and so on. So we will uh, consider up the second quantum correction next. We will also consider um, integral curves on the configuration space parameterized by a by a, an arbitrary parameter S, which will be describing the configuration of a the true vacuum bubble inside of a background of the false vacuum. So with this general setup, next we can uh, obtain a system of dif uh, differential equation which can be solved in general. So we can obtain the solutions of the wheeler de Witt equation and the transition probabilities for any model of cosmological interest and of any desired order in semi-classical expansion. And as I said, high order terms in the semi-classical expansion will be the quantum corrections. Next. So let me present the most important result. Next. So uh, considering uh, a close FLRW metric, which describe a homogeneous and isotropic universe, we, we only have the scale factor as the degree of freedom coming from the three metric and the, the transition probabilities look like this. So the first, uh, the semi-classical contribution is the red one. So it starts at one and goes to zero. The first quantum correction has the same general uh, behavior, but with less probability. And the second quantum correction changes the behavior of the ultraviolet uh, and it goes to zero. So the, we interpret this transition probabilities as uh, the most probable size of the universe at creation. So the semi-classical contribution of the first quantum correction implies uh, that the universe it must be created at a special singularity, but and in the second quantum contribution, we obtain an avoidance of the initial singularity, so the universe should be created at a small value of the scale factor, but different than zero. Next. So this can also be performed uh, by including an isotropy, uh, and we obtain that the, this avoidance of the initial singularity is only possible when the uh, universe is isotropic. Next. So the main, next, the main reference is uh, this one, uh, if you want to check out uh, details, and thank you for, very much for your attention. Okay, great, Daniel. You have one minute more if you want to say something or you want to listen to the gong. No, the gong is okay. <laughs> okay, just point me the gong. <laughs> okay, uh, let's do the next one. Uh, Raul Rojas, Mejias, are you here? Okay. Um, wait, 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 wait. Do you listen to me, right? Yes, yes, wait. Okay. Let me put it here. Sorry. Okay. okay. One, two, three, go. Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone, again. Uh, I now talk about uh, stable black holes in asymptotically flat space-time. 
Uh, in the real world, black holes are not isolated objects. They interact with their environment, absorbing and emitting radiation. The stability of black holes is a relevant aspect to study as it may provide insights into the formation and evolution of supermassive black hole and the center of galaxies. Next, please. Okay, to begin, let's consider the simplest case. Imagine a non-rotating electrically neutral black hole in thermal equilibrium with the, for instance, uh, the cosmic microwave background. Um, this means that the Hawking radiation or the Hawking temperature equals the temperature of the CMB. If this black hole absorbs a small amount of mass, let's say it catches a lonely comet passing by, and then it grows a little bit, uh, but its temperature decreases. Now our black hole is cooler than the CMB. As a consequence, it absorbs radiation um, from the CMB at a higher rate than it emits. And as a result, the black hole enters an endless process of growth. The Churchill black hole cannot be in a stable equilibrium from the thermodynamic point of view. Next, please. So for electrically charged black hole, local stability requires two conditions. The positivity of heat capacity, uh, that is the black hole temperature increase as it grows, ensuring it radiates the excess energy returning to its previous states and positive electric permittivity, that is the electric potential difference phi between the horizon and infinity must increase when the electric charge increases and this makes it harder for the black hole to gain more charge. These two conditions follows from maximizing the entropy under fluctuation in charge and in energy. The question is, can thermodynamically stable black holes exist in asymptotically flat space-time? I would like to present two scenarios where this actually happens. Next, please. The first one is in Einstein-Maxwell-Gauss-Bonnet theories. The corresponding black hole solutions is very well known, and here thermodynamically stable configurations arise when the coupling constant uh, to the Gauss-Bonnet term alpha takes positive values. And next, please. And the second is in Einstein-Maxwell scalar theories, provided the scalar field has certain class of self-interactions. Here, there is a whole family of scalar field potentials originated from supergravity models supporting uh, exact black hole solutions that contains thermodynamically stable configurations. And next, please. Uh, let's see in more detail what these black holes stable, what these stable black holes are in both cases. So in the, um, in the two plots at the top, we have the Gauss-Bonnet uh, gravity case and in the two plots at the bottom, we have the, the Hale black hole case in Einstein-Maxwell scalar uh, theories. The plots are phi versus Q in, in the left part and T versus, T versus S in the right part of the slide. And here we have split the phase space into three regions, A, B, and C for each case. And the interesting thing here is that in both theories, which are completely uh, different, we have three regions. In, in only in the region A, we have uh, full stability. In what sense? In the sense that the heat capacity, which can be read from the slopes in T versus S plot, is positive. And in the phi versus Q, the slopes um, means the electric permittivity, which is also positive in region A. This happens in both cases, as I told. And when in the Gauss-Bonnet case, when the when alpha is going to zero, the coupling constant, region A disappears, and we have the five-dimensional Reissner nordstrom black hole. And in the Hayri case, when the scalar field is turned off, region A also disappears. So that's it. Final remark, next, please. So thermodynamic stability of black holes in asymptotically flat, space-time is relevant um, to understand the long-term behavior. Okay, you can close the idea if you want. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Raul.
É... Então, Hi, Cecília, can you hear me? Yes. My memory is not as nice as the previous ones. <laughs> no problem. Okay, one, two, three, go. Okay, so today I'll be talking about quantum back reactions in ADS3 for massive gravity. So first, I'll tackle what is quantum back reactions, what are what are massive gravity theories, and then we'll mix both. Next. So, what is a quantum back reaction? First, let us understand what is a classical back reaction. A back reaction is what happens when we couple matter to a, to a vacuum field equation. So in general relativity, if we add matter, that translates into adding a stress energy tensor, right? And it, when plugging the stress energy tensor, the metric will get corrected, right? Uh, the, because we are, we are modifying the, the field equations, right? And the correctant metric will be as follows. Uh, uh, if, the, if the metric uh, is corrected, as a, the vacuum and a correction that is a back reactant metric uh, how do we make this quantum uh, easy right we, we just make all the matter uh, all the matter fields into quantum operators and the and the stress energy momentum tensor will be now a quantum operator uh, with an expectation value of of course next so this is not easy, right? Uh, I said easy, but it's really not easy because uh, computing this expectation value involves finding uh, green functions that usually requires numerical methods. Uh, our choice is a perturbative choice uh, in two plus one BTC uh, as the background uh, for a conformally coupled scalar field. And this uh, translates to equation two. And as this is a conformally coupled scalar field, we see that the trace uh, is equal to zero, right? All in order. Next. So, uh, how do we how do we make this quantum back reaction happen? We plug this quantum matter into the field equations, and we need to add n coupled scalar fields since if we expand uh, the propagation uh, the propagation of the graviton and the matter fields have the same order. Next, and since we have the same order. And we need to keep this semi-classical. We consider n couple scalar fields, so we can keep the classical, the classical the, the classical gravity fields, and uh, the quantum matter fields. Next. So now, what is new massive gravity? New massive gravity is a quadratic two plus one goes free massive gravity theory, and of course, it has four order field equations. And the constant solutions for this theory are double degenerate. And if we if we set ourselves in a special point where lambda is equal to m squared, then the two vacua coincides. Next. Expansion around this vacuum recovers the massive first Pauli action, uh, but with the identification which considers the graviton being the linearized Einstein tensor. How, how does this look? Equation 9 shows that the massive graviton equation is, um, is completed by the linearized Einstein tensor. This means that this is a mass, uh, we can interpret this as a massive graviton with two local degrees of freedom. Next. Now, uh, the parameter uh, point uh, which uh, admits a single vacuum admits hairy black hole solutions, has black hole solutions for all values of the cosmological constant, and has a conformal veil invariance at the linearized level. This additional conformal uh, veil invariance is really key for mixing them both. Next. So, if we want to mix the quantum matter effects on the dynamics of this massive spin to graviton, uh, then we only can do this. Uh, we only can solve the semi-classical equations if we do this in the special point. Uh, we cannot solve this for turbo till we if we are not in the special point. Next, the corrections will go as follows. The quantum back reacted metric function is twelve. And we see that this is still uh, ADS, uh, BT set, the first two terms, but the new subleading orders are of order R log R and R. So next, these new subleading orders uh, will account for relaxed brown, brown Heno uh, asymptotic uh, conditions, right? Uh, this is really relaxed respect to brown Heno. So we look for the asymptotic symmetry generators, and we find that this is still um, this is still the invariant under two copies of the with algebra, and uh, this means that this is still asymptotically ADS, even though the falloffs are higher than order one. Next, and we find 
two additional symmetry generators, 13 being, uh, being associated with pneumatic gravity and 14 because of the logarithmic pack reaction. Next. Ex if we need to expand this to higher curvatures, no, 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 no. If we if we want to Sorry. expand this to higher curvature, we need a higher. Uh, uh, you you. Uh, uh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. You, you, uh, you skip to the slide. Sorry. Sorry, my, my bad. Then uh, you want to say something uh, to to end this? Uh, no, it was the previous slide because you skipped the ah. previous slide. Okay. 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 So okay, this okay. was ten seconds. Uh, I was at ten seconds at this point. Uh, if you want to extend this, not just to quadratic curvature the theories, but arbitrary, you just need to uh, have a theory that has a unique vacuum and possess, still possess a conformal symmetry at the linearized level. Equation 15 is the Lagrangian that uh, obeys those two conditions, and you can repeat the whole process that we did. That's it. Okay, thank you. So, Maxi? Are you here? Mm -hmm. um, we can't. We can't hear you, Maxi. Oh. Um, I, I think you have. Okay. I see. Yes. 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 Oh, no. Okay. 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 One, two, three, go. Okay, my name is Maximiliano Ferro. I am PhD student at uh, Universidad Nacional de La Plata. Uh, I will talk about um, the existence of internal boundary conditions under irrelevant deformations. Uh, next. And next. Next. Yes, please. Uh, no, no. Uh, in general, um, an internal uh, quantum field theory poses an infinite set of mutual uh, commutative internal of motions. Uh, without uh, boundaries, these internal of motions come from a uh, local current. But in presence of boundary, the existence of uh, this local current is not sufficient to ensure the internal uh, condition. To obtain the internal of motion, we need impose a particular internal conditions. Um, for example, uh, see the seminar work of uh, Goshal and Samoloshikov in 1903. Uh, of course, in general, the boundary condition can be specified uh, at uh, an, with an extra term in the functional action. Okay, next. Um, in other hand, there are a, a, a type of uh, irrelevant deformations uh, which preserve the, inter the interability along uh, the flow. Uh, these deformations are triggered by the, um, the determinant of the energy momentum tension and is called a um, TTR deformation. But uh, in the presence of a, a boundary, we need to define a parametric deformation also for the boundary term, uh, such that it preserves the interability condition under the flow. This problem is a first study uh, by Shang, Lovert, and Song in uh, um, 21, but um, there are uh, a several open questions. Uh, for example, a family of non-trivial boundary condition under this deformation uh, remain um, an intriguing in, in question. Um, OK, next. Um, okay, first consider a two-dimensional quantum field theory. Uh, the, um, the Euclidean invariance uh, lead to an, uh, the concept of a uh, strong energy tensor. Um, but in addition, uh, in internal quantum field theory, uh, we have a uh, generalized um, higher spin uh, uh, tensors. Uh, which also satisfy a, a conservation equation. Uh, and from this current, uh, local current, we can construct uh, internal motion, uh, take the, um, the internal uh, are, uh, along uh, some contour, but this internal not depend on the selection of the contour. Next. Um, okay, uh, we, we can uh, write the Euclidean uh, conserved charges as um, a linear combination of the complex uh, conserved charges and define 
local densities eh, conserved eh, as follow. Uh, okay, eh, next. But next, okay. Eh, in the present, no, no, okay. sorry, the, the previous. Okay. Um, in, in the presence of, um, of a boundary, this internal of, of motion are in general no conserved. Um, okay, next. Um, uh, in order to guarantee the conservation, we need to um, choose a boundary function to compensate the uh, the the no conservation in the in the boundary. The the trivial is, uh, election correspond with a boundary condition um, like uh, no uh, energy momentum flow uh, through the through the boundary, but uh, also uh, there are uh, more generalized uh, more general uh, boundary conditions. Uh, the key point is find a, a total derivative a, a, a function that uh, which guarantees uh, the conservation uh, condition for the um, higher spin uh, uh, tensors. Okay, next. Um, is the the Lagrangian formal is 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 useful uh, in this in this formal? Okay, you want to close the something yes. here? Yes, the, the the okay the pre, the previous one. Okay, the problem is uh, if if um, we evaluate the um, the um, continue the continuity conditions uh, for the higher spin um, operators, which um, we find a uh, trivial boundary conditions and uh, in this moment we work on search a non-trivial boundary condition uh, okay the final slide okay well, five seconds okay uh, okay we assign the problem in 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 more general uh, theories like interacting the is in is very interest map the problem to gt gravity coupled with cft and um, other example a uh, very interest uh, uh, with a strong interest is Lewis field theory, uh, and we work in in it. Uh, sorry. So okay, thank you, Maxi. Oh, thank you. So, uh, well, are you here? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Yes. Fritjo Wango. Okay, I'm Nahuel Shazbek, I'm a student of the University of La Plata, and I'm going to be talking about non-geometric symmetries of 10D supergraph. Next. Next. Sorry, it wasn't working there. <laughs> okay. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Let, let, let me put it again, because it wasn't working the... <laughs> I, I lost you, Pierre. Like... That's okay. That's okay. How are you? Like 15 seconds. Okay. Okay. Okay, go. So these non-geometric symmetries are related to T-duality. So I'm going to briefly touch upon what T-duality looks like in supergravity outside of string theory. And uh, how we work with T-duality, which is this beta symmetry of supergravity, and what we, and why we think it's useful and yeah, interesting. Next. So well, T-duality is a duality that it's original from string theory, but it leaks into uh, the supergravity in the low energy limit of string theories, uh, the supergravity theories that arise from string theory in a particular way. The way in which uh, it appears is as an internal symmetry of the fields after one performs a compact unification. It's not immediately obvious that the duality is there, but only after a compact unification. So for us, T duality is an ODD symmetry of the fields. Next. Uh, since it arises in compactifications, it's natural to study T duality in supergravity by performing Elsa-Klein compactifications. This is done in basically two steps. The first one is by truncating the fields and make them depend only on the internal coordinates, not, not sorry, the external coordinates, not the internal ones. And then by performing some field redefinitions and isolating the parts 
the transform under this ODD group and, and identifying those that, that don't and well, writing everything as an ODD uh, in ODD objects and that's how one finds this ODD symmetry. That is the dual idea. After all, next. Uh, what one can work with the duality with by performing compactifications. There are other approaches. One that deserves mention is double field theory, which is interesting because it 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 is able to write everything as an ODD object uh, from the get go. Everything in the theory is written as an ODD object, uh, but at the expense of New, adding new structure to the theories. In this case, by doubling the number of coordinates. Uh, then one then has to work with this, handle this, this new structure in, in some way by imposing co constraints and fixing uh, the ODD gauge in order to recover information about the supergravity limit if one wants to do so. So it's, it's subtle, it's intricate. So that's why, next, that's why we prefer to work with what we call the with asymmetry, which is which has some of the best things of what works, it allows you to work with the full ODD symmetry, uh, symmetry group without introducing new coordinates, and without also uh, doing compactifications. It's a way to treat ODD as if it were a symmetry of the parent theory without uh, compactification. Uh, and how do we do that? Since ODD only appears after compactification. Well, we do it by introducing this constraint that, that it's box right there. Uh, this parameter beta is a parameter of the transformation. It's an anti-symmetric bivector, which after construction with the partial derivative always gives zero. This co condition is exactly like asking, it's exactly like saying we're, that we're performing a calcium line compactification. Next. So basically, beta symmetry is both a set of transformation rules for the fields in the theory, in this case, the field line or the metric, the Calder-Mont field and, and the Dilaton, plus this constraint. So by using both, we, we can effectively work as if it were a symmetry of the, of the or, or original theory, and it works as such. I mean, the symmetry algebra closes, and all the nice things that we want. Next. And it's useful, for example, in this case, um, I, I can, one application, to which we can use this is to, for example, it fixes the two derivative action of, of supergravities. Uh, just uh, if we, the, all, all the other terms, all the terms compatible with the previous symmetries are what, what we see above, but they don't, the other symmetries don't fix the relative coefficients of these terms, asking the mm -hmm. variance of the Lagrangian fixes them, so it's, it's a very easy way to deal with uh, with, uh, with with the effective actions. It's a, it comes very naturally. Next, please. And some things were interesting to, to see if uh, to to study are, for example, alpha prime erections. There are reasons to believe that double field theory can. Uh, okay. Run out time. Just okay. to close. Okay. Yeah. Just to close very briefly. There are reasons to believe double field theory doesn't work. Uh, or the alpha prime cubed, but uh, beta symmetry in principle doesn't have any reason as to why it wouldn't work. So it seems interesting to, to see what information we can extract from there. And also as a betas can serve as a solution generating technique uh, because it maps solutions into other solutions. Uh, this is closely uh, tied to yang baxter equation and deformations, etc. So yeah, that, that, that's it, thank you. Great, thank you, Nahuel. Um, now we have uh, five minutes. Uh, well, we can use the same go. Um, if somebody want to ask something to the previous uh, talker speakers, go ahead. I have a question. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I have a question for Cielo. I don't know if she's around. I was muted, sorry. Yes, I'm here. Hi, uh, I just have a small question about the properties of this massive graviton. I mean, because usually in GR we have, I mean, it's non-massive and 
that allows the graviton to propagate at the speed of light. But being this massive, how does that impact the model of gravity that you are describing here? Oh, so, right. So in GR, in four dimensions, one knows that the graviton is massless and uh, prog propagates two degrees of freedom, right? Sure. So mm -hmm. now we're working in two plus one dimensions, right? Because it has uh, plenty of reasons to study in two plus one dimensions. But uh, one of the main is that um, we want a toy model for uh, a toy model for studying how quantum matter interacts with uh, with classical graviton. So, uh, what do we find? That analytic uh, uh, computations for this quantum matter uh, stress energy momentum tensor is really difficult to do in four dimensions. And as a toy model, we first uh, studied that in two plus one dimensions, where it has been plenty studied that uh, this has uh, the, the the form that I show, right? uh now working in two plus one dimensions is kind of a struggle if you want to uh, make a toy model for a graviton right Be because the classical graviton in gr in four in four in four dimensions has two local degrees of freedom but in three dimensions it doesn't propagate any degree of freedom right oh, yeah that's right mm -hmm. yeah so that's what's what's the um, so we know that gr uh, if we expand it you have massless fierce pauli action but what if what if it has mass, right? In four dimensions, massive first Pauli has five degrees of freedom, but in new massive gravity, if, if you expand this, you have two local degrees of freedom, but for a massive graviton, you you actually find massive first Pauli. Like you have an additional term that equates to uh, the the massive first Pauli equation, and you know that it's massive first Pauli equation because you vary it and you obtain the the wave equation, right? The but for a massive graviton, but the massive graviton is not uh, h as before, right? Because we are working with a four order field equation, so it's you kind of use it as an auxiliary auxiliary tensor. I don't know if the idea is more clear as to why we're no, working. No, yeah, I mean, I get it. I mean, first of all, you have the constraint of being on one dimension less, and second of all, as you mentioned, this whole set of dynamics that you mentioned before with the massive fields power, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. No, that helps a lot. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have a question? I have, I have a question for Maxi. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so at some point you mentioned that, that that one of the things that you want to do in the future is to link with JT gravity coupled to a CFT. Yes. So what we, what is the intuition behind? I mean, where do you get some intuition? There, that map, yes, there is a map uh, between TTUR deformations for uh, CFTs in Euclidean spacetime uh, with JT gravity uh, coupled with uh, CFT. In general. <clears throat> We can we can view a TT bar deformation as a, a background deformation. It's like a couple with a gravity, a, the the CFT, the two dimensional theory coupled with gravity. <clears throat> it's um, okay. Uh, we 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 can see as a change the the theory or change the the geometric background. This is the intuition. So your your idea is that the symmetries that you are gonna that you are constructing essentially will allow you to to do this. this map they are in in in, uh, in in other words, not not no not by by me. In, but you can do it. I mean, what yes. would you like to do? What is the thing that you would like to do? Is to construct. Okay. Yes. Study the the um, study the problem of um, boundary conditions in this in this setup. Because the only uh, well studied boundary condition are trivials. You, you, you uh, take a Dirichlet. Uh, generalize. I see, I see, I see. I see. But, uh, okay. okay, thanks. Okay, great. Uh, maybe we can. If somebody has another question, you, you can do it in, at the end. And so let's continue with the last five. So, Nico Cáceres. 
No, you want to hear me? Yes. Okay. So, Okay. uh, three, two, one, go. Well, hello, and you're a Casa, I'm a PhD student at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. And I want a, a person that work uh, in collaboration with uh, Rodrigo Soto from uh, Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile and Ignacio Salazar from uh, Universidad de La Plata. Next. Next. So uh, our work is about uh, holographic superconductivity in a flat path system. And uh, so that I... I, I I will explain what is a flat plot system. And uh, flat plot are simply uh, the personal relation that not depends of the momentum. And a classical example of that is when you have an electron moving in a two-dimensional plane and you uh, pass a magnetic field perpendicular to it. So if you solve the Schrodinger equation of that system, you will notice that the spectrum will not depend on the momentum or the vertical in this plane will only depend on the intensity of the uh, uh, magnetic field perpendicular to the plane. So that is, that is called uh, the Landau levels and is the most simple example of the uh, flat bands. So flat bands occur naturally and uh, we have a lot of interesting examples in which uh, it's present. Next. So, uh, Uh, two interesting systems that uh, exhibit uh, flat bands are the lip lattice and the Moriet uh, uh, lattice. So, a uh, lip lattice is simply um, a square lattice which we, we have uh, three atoms for uh, uh, unit cells. And uh, here in the in the figure, you can see the um, uh, diagram of the dispersion the energy relation of the system, and you can see that the green one is that uh, of the flat ones. But the other important system in which occur is when you have uh, two material uh, uh, layers and you uh, slightly twist. In that case, you create uh, different patterns in the electronic energy bands, and you can obtain a flat path system. And another example of that is the observed Vilayan graphene system. And uh, one particular of, of the system is that has a superconducting phase, and uh, it has three uh, fermions which, which have uh, a flat, flat band structure. So uh, next. The idea of this work, motivated by the work of uh, Nigorandi, uh, Yuri uh, Salazar, and so on, is, is trying to see if we can implement holographically uh, the flat band spectrum of the free fermions in the superconducting phase of a graphene delayer. So that is the problem we, we want to attack. And we will do it in the bottom up approach. That means that we will consider. The, the the basic uh, uh, peculiarities of, of the system, uh, his symmetries and his breaking of this symmetry, and we try to implement this in the bulk theory, uh, uh, putting the gauge field that is necessary to to have this this uh, breaking of the symmetry, and uh, if we if we want to to put a temperature in the system, uh, we will uh, use uh, the the structure of the graph. So that is the, the essential spirit of the bottom-up approach. So and next, uh, a way to implement the, the holographic flat bands, it was made by Eli Anton, and it simply uh, put uh, fermions in a asymptotically ADS uh, space-time and try to uh, use adequate uh, boundary condition to have uh, flat bands and, and to do it. So, uh, Uh, after the world of, of many people that implements a flat band system, uh, we, uh, we we will engineering the the system that uh, it has the the symmetry that uh, we want to to have for the layer system. Next, so uh, an effective action of the graphene B layer is this action uh, uh, five. We have a, a part of free fermions and a part of uh, of interaction between the 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 two component direct fermions, and this system exhibits a U2 global symmetry uh, um, as a special uh, rotational invariance, and uh, the term of the interaction explicitly breaks the U2 symmetry down to a U1 symmetry. 
So uh, what we what we what we want to do is uh, implement this breaking the, this breaking of this symmetry in a, a bulk theory. Next. You want to close the idea? To... I see that how many make many left. Yes, uh, like we are working with uh, you two, uh, this can explain that it's you two uh, uh, cross uh, you one, and we will try to obtain a numerical solution of this that will implement the the system and try to put fermions uh, on that and and see if we can implement the factors under this. Okay, thank you, Nico. Thank you. And... So. Mariana? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, oh it's very okay. I, 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 don't, I don't have to pass it. Okay. Great. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, three, two, one. A little bit Go. Because... Ah. Oh, sorry. Okay. I didn't hear you. What? <laughs> uh, could you como zoom a little bit there? Oh, yeah, because... yeah, yeah. Yes. Sorry, I got ambitious for power and I started the clock. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, now three, two, one, go. Go. Okay, hello everyone. Well, my name is Ariana. I am a master student at Pontificia Universidad Católica de Valparaíso in Chile. And today I will talk about a Hamiltonian formulation of asymptotic symmetries at null boundary or at null infinity. So, uh, well, we are interested in these asymptotic symmetries because this framework captures uh, all the non-trivial symmetries of con unconserved charges of any system with an asymptotic region or boundary. And these symmetries also expand the global symmetries of a theory and their corresponding asymptotic charges form a closed uh, algebra. So we develop a method in Hamiltonian formalism to obtain this symmetry, this asymptotic symmetries. And the simplest case uh, to study in this five minutes or four minutes is the uh, scalar, the massless scalar field, which uh, we know that it has no local symmetry, only asymptotic symmetry. So uh, to begin with the Hamiltonian formalism, we need to start by choosing a space-time foliation. And as we saw in the lectures, we can parameterize the null infinity by introducing these Bondi coordinates. So we use the Bondi coordinates and choose U as the time coordinate to do the Hamiltonian evolution. U is the, is the retarded time. So the action is just the kinetic term of the massless scalar field. And then when we introduce these uh, coordinates, the Lagrangian density becomes uh, linear in velocities. And well, this is expected when null coordinates are chosen. So uh, continuing with the analysis, the canonical momenta is independent of the velocities. Consequently, uh, it becomes a primary constraint. So uh, this is a constraint that we want to know if, if this constraint is a symmetry generator or just reduce the degrees of freedom. And well, to know that we compute the Poisson brackets be between the constraints. And in general, this is equal to some uh, matrix, some matrix omega. This is a, a what is, no, arriba. Okay. <laughs> so matrix omega. Yes. Okay, this omega matrix. Okay, this matrix, um, uh, uh, the invertibility of this uh, omega means the absence of zero modes. However, we find uh, found that uh, this matrix has some zero modes, are, are independent zero modes, that are solution to this equation. And these zero modes are symmetry generators. So if we have uh, some symmetry generators that are, are independent, when we take this limit to uh, are going to infinity, this uh, zero mode is still uh, at the boundary. So with these zero modes, we can uh, compute uh, the symmetry generator. And when, well, and also we can expand uh, the fields. And we found this uh, falloff 
of the fields that we can see in the end of the symmetry. And then with the zero modes, we compute the symmetry generator and, okay, and below, okay. thank you. The symmetry generator, and we can compute this generator, the Poisson bracket with, between this uh, symmetry generators, and they are per class. Uh, we can compute the transformation of the fields, and using the fallop, we can see that the fields that transforms are only the boundary, uh, the boundary terms of the fields, some boundary terms. Uh, well, continue. Uh, you can continue with the formalism and, well, you can find that this generator isn't differentiable and to make it differentiable, you need to add uh, some boundary term and these boundary terms correspond to uh, the concept charge that is in uh, below. Charge, yeah. yes, this concept charge uh, is, is there and, well, uh, continuing, you can uh, integrate over the null infinity and you find that the concept charge or this asymptotic charge is the same that uh, Campiglia found in this paper using soft theorems. Okay. Uh, that's it. Do you want to finish saying oh, something? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Brianna. So, Luis? I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, uh, three, two, one, go. Uh, thank you. Let me let me start, thank you, the organizer, for uh, putting together this conference and give me the opportunity to present my work. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, as as PhD student at the staff, and in collaboration with Miguel Montero and IFT. This is work based on a, a oncoming paper and next, please. Uh, let us consider the, the topological couplings of N theory on a 11 dimensional manifold in particular on a manifold uh, with, with boundary. The topological turn of N theory uh, consists of a free form and a field strength a full form, and this, uh, as usual in a string theory, doesn't obey um, a standard direct quantization law. Uh, and this ingredient, um, and we want to study the inflow of this topological term of these ingredients to the to the boundary. This question uh, was originally considered by by Hochaba and Witten in the mid nineties, and we will see uh, what they found. This uh, next slide. Uh, it is a, a standard procedure to look at the anomaly theory of a, of a, of, a, of, a, of the eleven dimensional term in general of a d dimensional theory is is standard to to look at the anomaly theory on a one dimension higher and in this case uh, we lift the topological couplings of n theory to twelve dimensions and. And when we consider the the quantization law of the form form, uh, and we plug in in the anomaly theory of the chan Simons term, uh, Hochaba and Witten show that uh, this anomaly theory of the bulk term of n theory is equal to minus the anomaly polynomial of E A gauge theory, uh, roughly is equal to the anomaly polynomial of the heterotic. E8 cross E8 heterotic string theory, where we consider N theory on an 11 dimensional manifold with two boundaries. And the question uh, we will consider here is whether there is another or other boundary conditions of N theory than uh, E8 gauge theory. Let us consider uh, all classically algebra and exceptional algebras. And in particular, in this work, for simplicity, we will consider only uh, exceptional algebras, exceptionally algebras. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our, our setting will be the following. 
uh, we will consider a supergravity multiplet and char matter uh, scattering differ uh, in different uh, representations of the exceptional algebras we will consider. And uh, the standard way to study perturbative anomalies is by index theory of Atiya and, and Singer. And uh, we will compute the anomaly of this of this matter, supergravity multiplet and char matter in terms of, of these indices and in terms of characteristic classes, uh, in particular uh, classes measuring the non-topological information of the tangent structure and the gauge structure and the gauge bundle structure. Next, please. <clears throat> Uh, when we do that, we can write down uh, um, arbitrary anomaly polynomial of, of that of that matter considered in the previous slide, and correspond to that equation is an anomaly polynomial, uh, a twelve-dimensional anomaly polynomial, and the conditions to factorize that anomaly polynomial um, <clears throat> becomes into the two last equations: one for uh, cancel the gravitational obstruction to the factorization and the other is the gauge obstruction to get uh, the factorization. Um, we need to compute indices or, or Casimir invariants of, of, of the um, gauge group structure. And uh, to fill that two last equation doesn't guarantee that the anomaly polynomial will factorize. But uh, if we fill that two conditions, those two conditions, we can try to uh, or intend to factorize the anomaly polynomial uh, in terms of we want. Next, please. Uh, there is a the known solutions. We found a known solution that creates a solution of Shaman Witten with matter in the general representation, but we also found another solutions of the exceptional algebras. At the end, the main point is that all the solutions that factorize the anomaly polynomial uh, come from branching rules, or you can show that all the polynomials are factorized in the way we want come from EA gauge theory by branching rules. And that's the, the message. Okay. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. So, Agustina, are you here? Yes. yes. Okay, okay, great. Okay, uh, three, two, one, go. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, the title of this talk is Hidden Symmetries from Extra Dimensions. And it's a work in progress we have been doing with Marco, Diego, and Carmen Nunez. So next, please. So in this work, we introduced the alpha symmetry principle, which uh, essentially the idea is that um, in the, um, uh, if we have a collusive claim reduction, the symmetries of a higher dimensional theory uh, that are broken in the compactification process can actually be realized in the lower dimensional theory um, as a global symmetry princi principle that um, we constrain parameters. So in imposing this alpha symmetry principle, uh, we can actually fix couplings in the lower dimensional theory. So they can, this approach offers a very practical tool for fixing interactions in lower dimensional supergravity and string theories. So next, please. So consider we have a d-dimensional spacetime that is going to split into n external dimensions and small d internal dimensions. So consider a tensorial density v that uh, is defined on this higher dimensional spacetime. So it depends on external coordinates x as well as internal coordinates y. So here we write the lead derivative of this uh, tensorial density with a, a parameter psi. Uh, so when we perform the calusset claim uh, reduction, we expect the fields not to depend on the internal coordinates. So in the reduction ansatz we propose for the tensorial density V, we can see that the components only depend on the external co coordinates X and not on the internal coordinates. As for the C parameter, we see that the higher dimensional diffeomorphisms break into n-dimensional diffeomorphisms into gauge transformations and to general linear transformations in the compact space. But there is also an extra transformation that we call the alpha transformation because it's generator, generated by these alpha parameters that are constant parameters and they have to satisfy a, a constraint in order to uh, be consistent uh, with the Kaluza claim reduction. And that constraint is that the contraction of these parameters with the external derivatives uh, have to be uh, zero. 
has to vanish. So this guarantees that the alpha transformation of the uh, that we perform is not going to depend on the internal coordinates, right? So here on the bottom uh, right of the of the slide, we can see how the alpha transformation operates on the different components of the V tensor, and we see that the, all the uh, external and internal components are all mixed. So saying this about this constraint, it's not very hard to um, to believe that if we have um, an invariant, for example, the Lagrangian that is invariant in, in the higher dimensional theory, after the dimensional reduction, that invariant is going to still be invariant. Um, so it's going to be uh, symmetric under alpha transformations. So we are going to use this as the alpha symmetry principle, and we're going to use this idea to um, fix couplings in the compactified theory. So next, please. So here I'm going to show an example of this method. Uh, in the case of pure Einstein gravity, here we show the parameterization of the metric tensor. And then we perform the alpha transformations. Uh, we see the alpha transformation. We compute these transformations for each of the components of this metric tensor. And then we propose the most general Lagrangian that has to be invariant under n dif diffeomorphisms, then dimensional diffeomorphisms, gauge, tra gauge transformations, and general linear transformations in the compact dimension. So the Lagrangian we propose that is in, uh, has all these symmetries is the one that I wrote there. So we see that there are uh, some arbitrary coefficients, and these coefficients are going to be fixed through the uh, uh, imposing the alpha symmetry. So by imposing the alpha symmetry, we can fix these uh, coefficients, and this way we completely fix the Lagrangian of this uh, lower dimensional theory, this theory that comes from a higher dimensional one. So next, please. We have performed this uh, same procedure in different other cases, for example, half maximal supergravity um, and also 11 dimensional supergravity that the reduce in a circle gives a type 2a supergravity in 10 dimensions. And also we uh, have our intention is to use this method to compute higher derivative corrections in the type 2a supergravity. And we have done some progress uh, computing some quartic Ramon Ramon terms in this uh, type 2a supergravity. So this can be a very useful method in these cases where the couplings are known, but we know that the theory comes from uh, another theory, a higher dimensional theory, and is being reduced as, as such as a yeah, Kalusa chain procedure. So um, next. So okay. okay. It was prepared <laughs> all the time. <laughs> okay, thank you, Martina. Um, So last one, but not least, Eric. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Okay, uh, three, two, one, go. Okay, let me start thanking the organizers for inviting me to give a talk in here. I will talk about double field theory and um, formalism related to heat quality invariant uh, hydrodynamics. This is a project with Nahuel Mironganese, and in our last project, we also work with Yuho Sakatani. Next one, please. So um, since I am the last one, I can take advantage of some of the previous talks. Uh, for example, Nahuel and Agustina described a little bit about double field theory. So I can just briefly say that in this kind of double geometry formalisms, we can try to describe the low energy limit of string theory using two duality invariant objects, like the Ricci, like the generalized Ricci scalar that you can see in this slide. And in the, in the framework of double field theory, this object depends on two fundamental fields, a generalized metric and a generalized dilaton. And when one breaks the double geometry, which is needed in order to make ODD uh, a manifest symmetry, we can recover the full Lagrangian of, um, of the NSNS -NS sector of string theory. So in this kind of geometry, the, the, uh, the rich scalar and the rich tensor are well defined. This means that we can construct the Einstein tensor. And the idea is to try, or, or our, my motivation, my main goal is to try to construct an energy momentum tensor in order to define a kind of DFT cosmology in the double geometry and try to obtain some string cosmologies. We know from the very beginning that we cannot use this method in order to, to obtain the full family of string cosmologies because T duality rotates the form of your energy momentum tensor. For example, if you consider a perfect fluid, but we will try to construct the equivalent of the double perfect fluid in the, in the double geometry and try to obtain a subfamily of uh, string cosmologies. Next one, please. 
So um, the trick that we are going to use in order to construct the energy momentum tensor is the scalar field perfect field correspondence that in here you can see the method in GR. If you start with the scalar field and you perform these identifications in terms of hydrodynamic variables, in terms of the velocity, the energy density, and the pressure, you can obtain uh, with this kind of um, formal correspondence, the energy momentum tensor for a perfect fluid. Next one, please. So in the double geometry, we, we use this trick in order to construct this energy momentum tensor that you can see in this slide. We, we know how to construct the, the Lagrangian for the, for the scalar field. We perform the, the identifications in compatible with this geometry, which is a T duality invariant geometry. And finally, we obtain an energy momentum tensor which uh, we could extend in, in a recent work with Yuho Sakatani and Nahuel Mirangranese. In here, you have the reference if you want to see something beyond the perfect fluid case. This is the, 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 the analog of the perfect fluid in the double geometry. And the idea is to parameterize this energy momentum tensor and try to inspect which kind of extreme cosmologies we can obtain using, using this energy momentum tensor. Next one, please. So when we perform um, um, the cosmological ansatz, considering double field theory, and we couple this, this new energy momentum tensor that we constructed using this equivalence with a, with a perfect fluid and um, scalar field dynamics, we obtain this family of, of string cosmologies where the, the, um, the source for the B field has to be vanished in order to have compatibility with T duality. And also the source for the dilaton has to be related to the pressure as you can see in the last part of this slide. Next one, please. And finally, double field theory is very famous because we can obtain alpha prime corrections when we inspect the vacuum, the vacuum part of the theory. And we decided to inspect this kind of higher derivative corrections in double field theory in presence of our energy momentum tensor. And we obtain alpha prime corrections or higher derivative terms correcting the matter. We have alpha prime corrections for both the vacuum part and the matter when we work in the double geometry. When we, but when we parameterize everything to supergravity, all, all the corrections from the from the left part of, of, of this of this equation that you can see here in this slide uh, are cancelled using field redefinitions. And these field redefinitions are the same field redefinitions that one needs in order to obtain the normal transformations in, in, in your, for example, in your metric or in your or your field line, because you need to cancel particularly a higher derivative transformations that typically we don't want. And when we use this method, automatically the left hand side of this equation um, is not corrected anymore. All the alpha prime corrections get absorbed in this um, in this kind of um, in this kind of uh, redefinitions. Sorry. And nowadays we are continuing this line together with Nahuel Miron Granese. And we are inspected perturbations in this kind of double field theory cosmology. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Okay. With that, uh, we finish the on session. Uh, thank you all the speakers. Uh, well, okay, for, for being here, uh, for staying. Um, I will stop sharing. Um,